Singapore is a small nation with no natural resources, so it has to contend with various factors when considering events. Other than employing diplomacy to strengthen international ties, Singapore also uses the concept of deterrence as part of our defense strategy. But what is deterrence? In a nutshell, deterrence is to show a willingness to respond to any attack by potential aggressors with a counterattack of equal or greater magnitude. Here's a simple analogy. Let's say country A is an enemy of country B and that country A wants to destroy country B. But if country A were to do anything, country B has a military arsenal capable of inflicting the same or greater damage back on country A. Hence, the military arsenal of country B deters country A from attacking it. A real life example would be the military doctrine of mutual assured destruction demonstrated during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were involved in a nuclear arms race and there was a lot of diplomatic tension between the two countries. However, the diplomatic tensions between the two countries never escalated into a full-blown war. Both countries were wary about the possibility of a war escalating into a nuclear war. And in the event of a nuclear war, both sides are sure to sustain serious destruction. Hence, nuclear deterrence helped the two countries avert outright war. Now that you understand what deterrence is, let's take a look at what Singapore and other countries do to keep up their deterrence policy. Singapore has been actively procuring arms over the years. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or CIPRI, Singapore has spent over 7 billion US dollars on military spending every year from the year 2005 to year 2009. Beefing up its military capabilities in the air. In the sea. And on land. Other countries also acquire or develop numerous weapons, especially countries that are under the threat of war like Israel and South Korea. Or those countries considered superpowers such as the US, China and Russia. However, deterrence is not a panacea. That means deterrence is not perfect. To find out the issues surrounding deterrence, we interviewed Robert Carnoy, a defense writer, to share with us the failures of deterrence. Mr. Carnoy shares with us that even nuclear deterrence, supposedly the highest possible deterrence a country could have, does not work 100% of the time. It's not an absolute guarantee of security. So if you look at, for, for example, nuclear weapons as a deterrent and nuclear arsenals as a deterrent. So the fact that the United States, for example, is a nuclear power, that didn't stop Al-Qaeda from launching their attacks against New York and Washington. If you look at Russia as a nuclear power that didn't stop the Georgians or the Chechens from challenging Moscow. If you look at China as a nuclear power that didn't stop uh, or hasn't stopped the Uyghur separatists in Xinjiang 
and it hasn't cowed Taiwan into uh, surrendering to, uh, to Beijing. So that illustrates the limits to deterrence. If even nuclear deterrence is not foolproof, how then are we going to ensure the safety of a country? The key is balance. We need to balance the hard approach of deterrence with the softness of diplomacy. Let's use Singapore as an example. Singapore employs a two-fold strategy consisting of deterrence and diplomacy. Singapore constantly works to procure arms and to maintain a strong armed forces to act as a deterrent. At the same time, Singapore is also active diplomatically as well. Singapore builds its diplomatic ties through making agreements and deals with other countries. For example, Singapore has made various arms deals and defence cooperation agreements like the Five Power Defence Agreement. Singapore also engages in military exercises with other countries to foster greater military cooperation. For example, Exercise Wallaby which was held in 2010 and the recent Exercise Cook Tiger held in 2011. Also, when natural disasters befall other countries, Singapore consistently sends in military personnel to aid in disaster relief. Notable examples include the 2004 Aceh tsunami and the 2011 New Zealand and Japan earthquakes. From Singapore's example, we can see that deterrence alone cannot protect the country. A country must be able to employ diplomacy combined with deterrence for its defence policy to succeed. We must remember that it is always easier said than done and we must appreciate that a lot of work goes into maintaining the also delicate balance between diplomacy and deterrence.